which the liability of knowing assistance to account is determined. That was stated by Justice Gibbs in Consul Development Proprietary Limited and DPC Estate Proprietary Limited. That was a case from 1975 reported at volume 132 of the Common Law Reports, commencing at page 373. Can you give the justice once citation into the last of um, the particular quote? Thank you, Your Honour. The particular quote which we refer to is at page 379, which is that a person who knowingly participates in a breach of fiduciary duty is liable to account to the person to whom the duty was owed for any benefit he has received as a result of such participation. And that's the nub of it, isn't it? The phrase Precisely. as a result. Yeah. Precisely, Your Honour. And that's been repeatedly affirmed by this court, for example, in Warman and Dwyer, and also more recently in Ancient Order of Foresters and Life Plan. Now, what do you see as the difference between yourself and your opponent as to the application of that phrase or its, or, or its um, sufficiency? The difference we'd say between our submissions and the respondent's submissions, to the extent that we can address that difference, Your Honour, noting that uh, our submissions have been drafted based off slightly different questions, um, is that this notion of as a result of such participation is, mere, is the test to be applied. It doesn't require any further interpretation or distillation into any other sort of test. It is merely what profits were achieved as a result of. And so to determine whether or not a profit was achieved as a result of uh, a breach of fiduciary duty, this court must consider the facts of the case as well as the policy and objectives underlying the particular uh, breach of duty which liability is being imposed for. Now indeed, in determining whether a profit has been um, obtained as a result of, this then gives rise to two important points which this court should consider. The first, which is the theme of this appeal, is that in determining the liability of a knowing assistant, the court should have in mind that equity treats fiduciaries and knowing participants alike. Our authority for that is the statement of Justice Gagler at paragraph 80 of Ancient Order, where his honour says, there is no reason why the principle by which the knowing participant's liability to account is assessed should be, dif should be different from those by which the dishonest and fraudulent fiduciary's liability to account is assessed. Well, perhaps I will offer one reason, and you can uh, tell us whether that makes any sense. So one way to see one difference would be that for the fiduciary to discharge the duty of loyalty, for instance, she can ask for consent from the beneficiary. Therefore, even though the duty is onerous, the mechanism of discharging it is not that hard to satisfy. Now, can you say the same thing of the knowing assistant, on the other hand? No, Your Honor. However, that doesn't diminish the extent to which the knowing participant and the fiduciary should be held uh, liable according to the same standards. And this is because a knowing participant is only ever liable if the breach is a fraudulent one. And so this notion of obtaining consent simply doesn't arise because the breach itself is fraudulent, and moreover, the knowing assistant knows of that fraudulence. As Justice Gagler states in paragraph 71 of Ancient Order, this knowledge of fraudulence is itself unconscionable, and for that reason, equity imposes liability according to the same principles and standards as it would a fiduciary. Can I just take you back to paragraph 9, which you cite in your submission to Ancient Order, which you say that there is no test prescribed. As I read that paragraph, the court says that the but-for test will suffice. So how do you how do you make the submission, therefore, that but-for is not the test? We will refer again to Justice Gibbs' statement that it is whether or not the profits were made as a result of. But isn't this just a way of showing how? I mean, as a result of doesn't demonstrate cause. Aren't we asking about what is causation? Yes, Your Honour. And indeed, as the plurality at paragraph 9 and also Justice Gagler later in, at paragraph 80 have acknowledged, but for does suffice to make out that that's so what would be the alternative? Uh, the alternative is exactly what the plurality states at paragraph 9, which is that this should be, um, this question of causation depends on a precise examination of the particular facts of the case rather than upon attempts to refine the expression as a result of. So, so are you, is, it, is it your submission that it's just an impressionistic conclusion that a court reaches based on the facts to determine whether there's causation or not? Uh, to an extent, 
Yes, Your Honour. Insofar as the court must assess the facts of the case and also bear in mind the policy underlying the particular equitable obligations which it's enforcing, and with those particular uh, factors in mind, then determine whether or not the facts of the case satisfy the causal requirements as a result of. Because the but for test, what function does that perform in causation? The but for test, at least insofar as uh, it is usually applied, most familiarly in the realm of tort, uh, provides that clear link between a breach of whatever isn't legal obligation. It, isn't it an exclusionary rule? As isn't it operate to exclude causes? Applied in the realm of tort, yes, Your Honour. Mm. And for that reason, we say that it is inappropriate as the sole determinative test in equity. And this is because of the nature of the obligation which is being imposed, a fiduciary one or um, a third party assistance in breach of this fiduciary obligation. In particular, we would rely on the rationale which underlies the liability of both a fiduciary and also that of a knowing participant. So that was stated by this court in the 2004 case of Zoo and Treasurer. And that particular rationale was twofold. The first was to deter any breach of fiduciary duty and deter any conduct which would undermine the high standard required of fiduciaries. The second rationale is to rectify the inequitable character of permitting those persons, either a fiduciary or a knowing participant, to retain benefits resulting from their conduct. In that particular case, their judges, uh, their honours do cite Justice Gibbs in course of development. And so this particular rationale of deterrence and also rectifying inequity is consistent throughout the case law in Australia dealing with the liability of fiduciaries and third parties. Is it your submission that the liability of the participant is an independent one? Yes, Your Honour, based on the judgment of Justice Gabler in Ancient Order, where His Honour talks about the particular causal requirement which needs to be satisfied, which is that between the profits obtained and also the breach of fiduciary duty, which makes it uh, a separate, sorry, oh, which... So you say that it's not like joint tort feasors? No, Your Honour. They are uh, independent causes of action. The third party's liability only depends on the fiduciary's breach of duty, only insofar as fraudulent breach is an element of the action itself. But it's not in the perhaps criminal sense, an accessorial liability or a secondary derivative liability. It is its own standalone liability. However, because of its relationship to this fiduciary relationship, and because of the impact that it has on the fiduciary relationship, and also equity's purpose and concern in safeguarding the fiduciary relationship, the policy considerations which underlie the liability, that independent liability of the third party, are nevertheless the same as those which underlie the liability of a fiduciary. Now, that, the, the, the primary judge seems to have been upset a bit by this because he thought, well, you can end up getting too much, put it crudely, um, by going first against the uh, fiduciary, uh, then against the uh, 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 assistance, um, and the plaintiff ends up, as it were, getting too much enrichment out of all of this. What's the answer, do you say, to that? The answer we say, Your Honour, is that, uh, and this will be further developed by my learned junior when the matter is split election. However, the answer is that equity's purpose is prophylactic. And for that reason, equity should not shy away from imposing liability on every party which has breached an equitable duty merely because this will allow the plaintiff further recovery. This would entirely undermine equity's prophylactic purpose if one defendant could get off simply by pointing to a different breach by a different defendant, saying that they should discourse instead of themselves and for that reason evade liability for their own breach. <coughs> Returning then to the account of profits in this case, Having established that the particular test to be applied is a test of whether or not the profit was obtained as a result of the participation in, sorry, as a result of the breach of fiduciary duty, this alone suffices to establish that 
the Court of Appeal and Justice Len Kramer at first instance erred in law by applying a different test. However, our submission goes further. Not only did these two courts err in applying the wrong test, but moreover, the manner in which they did apply the Blackboard test, if indeed it was the correct test to apply, was also erroneous. This is because in applying the Blackboard test, ordinarily the court would be required to consider the actual state of events which manifested, and then compare that to a hypothetical alternative counterfactual, what would have happened if there had been no breach of fiduciary duty. However, this is the comparison which is prohibited to uh, the court. Namely, the respondent cannot rely on the fact that they might have made the profits by some alternative means. Our authority for that is again paragraph nine of ancient order, where the plurality states that a defendant cannot avoid liability to disgorge profits dishonestly made by showing that those profits might have been made honestly. In effect, their honours are saying that in a case such as this, the respondent cannot say that they're not liable to disgorge the entire profits made simply by saying that they could have made that same profit through some other means which didn't involve a breach of fiduciary duty. Their honour statement in ancient order is also consistent with other statements in other decisions of this court which uh, relate to the use of the counterfactual by a defendant when they attempt to limit their liability. Two examples would be in Warman and Dwyer, or alternatively from the Federal Court in Bernali and Chameleon Mining, or also from uh, England in the cases of Regal Hastings and Phipps and Boardman. In those various cases, it has always been stated that an errant fiduciary or a knowing assistant can't rely on the fact that they might have made the profits in any case, or that the plaintiff was unwilling or unable to make the profits themselves. Are you, are you making a submission about breach? No, Your Honour, we're making a submission oh. about uh, the extent to which the respondent can raise their counterfactual to show that but for causation is not made out. <clears throat> and again, this is consistent with equity's prophylactic purpose in imposing liability. Equity's purpose is to hold a fiduciary to their duty. Equity's purpose is therefore also to hold a knowing participant to their duty not to interfere with a fiduciary relationship. Because of that prophylactic purpose, equity therefore takes a strict approach when determining the liability of um, a knowing assistant to account for profits made. Finally, to demonstrate that uh, the New South Wales Court of Appeal and Justice Glen Kramer erred in their application of the test, We'll make a comparison to the two cases of Novichok and Michaelian from the English uh, Court of Appeal in 2015, and then also the, court, the case of Ancient Order from the High Court in 2018. Looking first to Novichok and Michaelian, in that case, the account of profits sought was the profits that the knowing assistant had made by subchartering vessels, which he had attained through a breach of fiduciary duty. Now, paragraph. 114, the court stated that what Mr. Nikitin, the knowing assistant, acquired as a result of his dishonest assistance, and also as a result of Mr. McElliot's breach of fiduciary duty, was the use of the vessels at the market rate. This meant that the profit which he had subsequently made on the subcharter was not directly or relevantly caused by the breach of fiduciary duty. However, McElliot is distinguishable from the current case. At what, paragraph 114, the court placed the emphasis on the fact that what Mr. McKeithen obtained was the charter of the vessels at market rate. If he wanted to subcharter vessels, then he would have had to obtain vessels at market rate at any rate from any alternative uh, charterer. What he, had to, what he received as a result of the dishonest assistance was a market rate uh, higher and any subsequent profits were not therefore relevantly connected to the breach of fiduciary duty. The difference in this case is that what Miss Valleys obtained from her knowing assistance was not the sale of her land at market rate. It was the sale of her land at a grossly inflated price. She obtained more money than she was due in that transaction. She then took that extra money and invested it into a share portfolio, which then grew in value. 
That same break in the causal link, which was found in Mikhail York, simply does not apply in this case because what Ms. Valley has obtained was more than market rate. But does it really matter that much, though? Because you could run a tracing argument if you want to say that the uh, extra profit from the sale of the land beyond market rate uh, yeah. is the subject of the construction trust, which then become the shares in a tracing line of reasoning, would that then allow us to address the problem without engaging with a line of English cases that doesn't really help us? Uh, not quite, Your Honour. And this is because uh, in previous cases, courts have held that the liability of a known assistant to account is a personal one as opposed to a proprietary okay. one. Entirely, though? Because it seems, it seems that it is open to consider this particular accessory to be a known recipient rather than a known system. So it is possible, is not to achieve what you're trying to achieve without diluting the proprietary purpose of the uh, fiduciary doctrine uh, that you're trying to uh, argue in favor of. We would note that the tracing argument is further undermined by the fact that although Ms. Valdez has conceded liability of a known recipient, what she received was not trust property, so the appellant didn't have any proprietary interest in that payment. Of course, if the appellant elected to void the transaction, then uh, there would be some sort of proprietary interest in the money that she paid over. But until that transaction was voided, then the money paid over is simply paid over, and there's no proprietary base through which the appellant could trace which is why this personal remedy of account is sought. Given that the causal link between the known, uh, the breach of fiduciary duty and that further additional profit made on the share portfolios can be made out and does satisfy the requirements as set forth by Justice Gibbs in Quantum Development, accordingly, this court should overturn the orders of the New South Wales Court of Appeal and Justice Glenn Kavanaugh and find that the second respondent is liable to account for the full $3 million profit that she made from those shares. If there are no further questions, may it please the court. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. May it please the court. Your Honours, as my learned friend alluded to earlier, I will be speaking to the remaining ground of appeal and also to the question of the split election. Turning first to our submissions on the ground of appeal concerning joint and several liability, we say that the learned trial judge erred by limiting the award of equitable compensation against the third respondent, Mr. Zelda, to $200,000. Uh, our submission is that the third respondent is actually liable for the full extent of the loss uh, suffered by the appellant in the order of $1 million. Uh, and that is because, in our submission, Your Honours, a knowing assistant, as my learned friend mentioned earlier, is jointly and severally liable for the whole loss uh, because of his participation in the wrongful enterprise, here a breach of fiduciary duty. And, Your Honours, there is a long line of authority both from Australia and elsewhere in the Commonwealth, uh, particularly in New Zealand and the United Kingdom, that supports a binding to this effect. Uh, most notably, Your Honours, in New South Wales, uh, that proposition has found comfort in the first instance judgment of Justice McClelland in the Supreme Court decision of the United States Surgical Corporation and Hospital Products International, and by Justice Young, a Chief Judge in Equity, in the 2004 decision of New Cap Reinsurance uh, Corporation Limited and General Cologne. And most recently, Your Honours, again this proposition was treated favourably by Justice Stevenson, again in the New South Wales Supreme Court in the 2019 decision of Edgewater Holmes and Donohoe. Now, what was going on in that case? Was that a case about release? Uh, no, Your Honour. In part, Your Honour, but also uh, Justice Stevenson in that decision had cause to consider both a knowing participant, had cause 
to consider knowing, considering uh, participation both and knowing assistance and knowing receipt. And it was in paragraphs 22 to 31 uh, that His Honor uh, considered those issues in relation to joint and several liability. And as my learned leader put to your honours earlier, and consistent with Justice Gabler's decision. What did he actually decide? He said that the, you see, in your honours. In one, released them both? Or is that, um, it was agreed in that decision, your honour, by both parties that joint and several liability applied. So uh, Justice Stevenson did not have to make a decision on the matter. He merely canvassed the authorities uh, on, on joint and the imposition of joint and several liability, but ultimately it was um, accepted by both parties that joint and several liability would apply. Because a mutual benefit was the subject of the suit in that case. Uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I couldn't. In that case, uh, there, was a, there, was, there was a pursuit of a mutual benefit. Yes, Your Honor. Is that not? Yes, Your Honor. Now, could you say the same thing of this case? We could, Your Honour, um, and I believe Your Honour is uh, referring to that exception in uh, the case of full federal court case of Grimaldi, uh, where Justices Stone, Perham, and Finn concluded that uh, when acting in concert to secure a mutual benefit, they could uh, find uh, imposed joint and several liability, and that is a point uh, that I will come to. The point, right? I'm sorry, they didn't decide the point. They didn't decide the point, but they said they did consider it, and uh, uh, but. But going to the heart of the matter, as my learned leader put to your honours, uh, in Ancient Order and Foresters, Justice Gabler at paragraph 71 and 77 uh, did find uh, that, and particularly uh, that a knowing assistant should be held jointly and severally liable uh, because, and I quote, knowing participation by a non fiduciary in a dishonest and fraudulent breach of fiduciary duty is conduct which is regarded in equity as itself unconscionable and as attracting equitable remedies against the knowing participant of the same kind as those available against the errant fiduciary. And uh, that was something that my learned leader uh, put to your honours moment, uh, moments ago. Uh, and we say, your honours, that that is precisely the case here. The third respondent, Mr. Zelda, prepared a surveyor's report that falsely stated the value of Whiteacre, and he was found at first instance by Justice Glenn Connor liable for knowing assistance in breach of fiduciary duty. Uh, it is our submission that therefore the third respondent should be treated in equity as if uh, he was the errant fiduciary. Uh, notwithstanding the authorities on the subject, uh, Your Honours, there are also powerful reasons of policy which support a finding of joint and several liability. Uh, for one, a finding of joint and several liability would be consistent, as my learned leader said, uh, with equity's prophylactic purpose. Uh, and let's just pause a little bit there. Would you say that when the remedy of equitable compensation is sought, the doctrine of equity that we have in mind still serves a prophylactic purpose? Or is it doing a, a different function? And we would say that in the imposition of joint and several liability, it would be fulfilling equity's prophylactic purpose. This is joint and several liability, I should say, for equitable compensation, though. What is it that we are being prophylactic about? Well, for one, uh, equity is concerned uh, as a matter of policy with the de facto regulation of the conduct of third parties in the fiduciary relationship. It is concerned to uphold the importance of that relationship and therefore that prophylactic purpose acts as a deterrence from people violating and interfering with that relationship. Uh, but of course, if your honours are against us on that argument, as your honour Justice Chen mentioned earlier, um, your honours should nevertheless find the third respondent uh, liable jointly and severally because of that exception considered by the full federal court in Grimaldi and Chameleon Mining. Uh, although in that case their honours were primarily concerned with the liability of third parties uh, when it came to profits uh, from knowing receipt or assistance, their honours at paragraph 558 said that in instances where a third party acts in concert with an errant fiduciary to secure a mutual benefit, the third party will necessarily be held jointly and severally liable with the fiduciary for any breach of duty. Uh, their honours came to this conclusion 
because... But was that a case about a good looking woman? Uh, no, it wasn't, Your Honour, but they, their honours did consider that in passing at paragraph 558 in the yeah. fourth paragraph of, of that section. Um, and their honours had in mind, uh, came to that conclusion and considered that in light of other uh, authorities on the matter, particularly uh, considered elsewhere, um, such as the English High Court decision in CNS Dolphin, um, and they came to that by ju justification for that rationale uh, was that an errant fiduciary and a knowing assistant are equally liable because they have jointly participated in the breach. Um, and so it is our submission, Your Honours, uh, that the rule in Grimaldi to which I referred and Justice Chen referred earlier uh, applies in the present case. Uh, although the first and third respondents did not derive a pecuniary benefit from the transaction, uh, they nevertheless acted in common design of procuring the sale of the second respondent's land at an inflated price in breach of fiduciary duty. Which I'm not sold about, if it makes any sense, in that I'm not sure what a benefit is that has been approved to uh, anyone other than um, uh, the knowing assistant to purchase the land. Uh, we I, say, I wonder what can you, yes, please do say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, Your Honour, Your Honour, uh, we, we do say that is satisfied because uh, that test did not expressly call for a pecuniary benefit. So it wasn't necessarily making profit or money from the enterprise. But what has happened here, we say that benefit element is satisfied because the first and third respondents, uh, knowing full well the um, enterprise that was to occur, that is the uh, selling of the property at $1 billion for the benefit of the second respondent that uh, constitutes the sufficient, uh, um, that satisfies that um, benefit element to which you are referred. So a, a father want, wanted his daughter to profit from the sale of the land? Yes, Your Honour. So, so in a way, love and affection is not a recognisable benefit in the eyes of equity, is it now? Is that what you're proposing? Uh, yes. <laughs> Close enough, it's good enough. Your Honour, we would, we would say that, of course, uh, yes, uh, in short, yes, Your Honour, we would say that. However, of course, that is only if this court finds against us on our primary argument, which is uh, in line with those authorities, particularly Justice Gagler's decision in Ancient Order of Foresters. Um, of course, um, before I move to the split election issue, um, it is necessary uh, to address some of the submissions that have been put to the court by my learned friends. Uh, in particular, my learned friends have cited the decision in Michael Wilson and Partners and Nichols as authority for the proposition that a knowing assistant is not liable for the whole loss caused by the fiduciary's breach of duty. Uh, in particular, they have relied upon paragraph 106 of that judgment and uh, which, where the court stated that, and I quote, if an account of profits were to be sought against both the defaulting fiduciary and a knowing assistant, the two accounts would very likely differ. And that is the quote, Your Honours. Uh, Your Honours, the court's statement there is not at issue in the present case. Uh, as a matter of logic, a knowing assistant and an errant fiduciary may well have profited differently. Uh, the knowing assistant and the errant fiduciary may, for example, have invested in different shares and therefore derived different profits. And uh, therefore, of course, uh, an account might very well differ. But the present case is distinguishable. Uh, we are concerned, at least in relation to the first and third respondents, with an established and quantifiable loss of $1 million. Uh, and I will refer your honors to our earlier submissions uh, on that matter. Uh, Question, what is the loss? Say that it is a naive question, Your Honour. Um, but on, one million dollars. Why Honor. is that's a quantification? That's the quantification of the loss. But what is the loss? It is the loss that the appellant has uh, paid an inflated price for the property. That is that is the loss. Perhaps you want to have a different formulation in mind? 
Um, but in any case, uh, that, that the authority cited by my learned friends on that matter is uh, distinguishable from the present case. Um, and of course, my learned friends also have cited the case of Edgewater, Holmes and Donohoe at paragraph 25 in support of their proposition that the liability of a knowing participant for loss suffered by the principal is now several only. Uh, however, Your Honours, that in our submission is simply not the case. Uh, Justice Stevenson expressly rejected that proposition at paragraph 27. Uh, His Honour examined the authority of Michael Wilson and Nichols, and again, uh, again, that passage I referred to earlier in paragraph 106, which purportedly supported that proposition, and His Honour concluded that that passage could not be relied upon. Uh, rather, His Honour concluded that that passage merely supported the proposition as held in Grimaldi, that fiduciaries and third parties are ordinarily severally liable when accounting for the profits that they make, which is the uh, position that I put to your honours earlier. Um, and briefly, your honours, uh, my learned friends say that the third respondent can only be liable for the whole loss arising from the first respondent's breach of fiduciary duty if his participation was crucial to the success of the breach, and they rely upon the plurality judgment in ancient order of foresters at paragraph, paragraphs 9 to 12. Uh, however, Your Honours, that was merely a finding of fact in that decision and cannot be taken to impart an additional, additional criterion uh, to support the finding of several liability only. Uh, and in any case, uh, on my learned friend's submission, we say that the third respondent's participation is not only crucial but critical. Uh, we submit that the valuation reports are inevitably critical to the purchasing of a property. A buyer needs to know that they're not buying a property at an inflated price. Uh, in the present case, the third respondent's report had the effect of deceiving the appellant into concluding that $3 million was a fair price for the property when its market value was $2 million. Your Honours, I turn then finally to the issue of the split of election. There is no authority that bars the appellant from seeking compensation against one or more defendants on the one hand and pursuing an account of profits from another defendant on the other hand. Now, this was examined at some length along with the relevant authorities by Justice Bergen in the New South Wales Supreme Court decision of Club of the Clubs and King Network Group. It was also a conclusion reached independently in the Queensland Supreme Court by Justice Lyons in the decision in DTM Constructions and Pool, and it has also been considered, uh, albeit in passing, in Warman International and Dwight in this court, and also again in passing uh, in Michael Wilson and Nichols. Uh, Your Honours, we submit that in addition to the authorities on the matter, that as a matter of policy, the appellant should be entitled to make a split election. Uh, to hold otherwise would allow the respondents who have already conceded their liability to escape sanction for their equitable wrongs. Uh, this must necessarily prevail over our learned friend's argument regarding inconsistent rights. Uh, it is our submission that it cannot be so that where one defendant makes no pecuniary or quantifiable profit, as is the case here, uh, the appellant must choose between an account of profits against one defendant or equitable compensation against the other. Uh, if the appellant is ordered to pursue an account of profits here, uh, that would lead to the inequitable result and defeat the prophylactic characteristics of equity, which my learned friend referred your honours to, particularly in Justice Gibbs' decision in Consul Development. Now, what do you say in opposition to your uh, opponent's uh, submissions on this point? Uh, we say, uh, my learned friends have said that $4 million, uh, in essence, would see, appear a windfall. Um, however, Your Honour, we say that, uh, particularly in relation to the account of profits, it is simply in this case that the second respondent has happened to make a profit of $3 million from her success in investing shares. It may be the case elsewhere that that profit is $1, $10, $100, and would not appear to be grossly uh, uh, unfair or, 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 or a 
windfall in any sense of the matter. Uh, we, uh, it is our submission that a split election should be allowed because uh, not only are these remedies pursued against different respondents for their part that they have played in this wrongful enterprise, but also uh, going to what my leader mentioned earlier uh, about the prophylactic purposes of equity, uh, particularly the Council of Development, we say that the split election must be allowed because it would uphold the importance of that fiduciary relationship by acting, as a matter of policy, um, as a deterrent against people interfering with that uh, relationship. So we say, to answer Your Honour, Chief Justice Governor's question, is that it must necessarily prevail over our learned friends' uh, submissions on that point. Um, if there are no further questions on, on the matter, those conclude the submissions for the appellate. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court. <coughs> May it please the court. The first round of this appeal concerns which causation standard equity should apply to Ms Valdez as a knowing recipient when determining whether she ought to account for her profit. Well, the word causation is rather um, misleading in a sense, isn't it? Uh, philosophers would find all sorts of things causing all sorts of results. It's really a sufficiency of connection, isn't it? Yes, Your Honour. That, that Between is the two circumstances. Yes, Your Honour, and the standard to which we hold that sufficiency to have been met is what is in contention before the court today. That is my meaning by the use of the word causation. It is the respondent's submission that the court, in considering which standard to apply, should adhere to the principle that the issue of causation must be determined by a precise examination of the particular facts of the case and that in these particular circumstances, the causation standard should be determined on the basis of the relevant duties owed and the relevant breach, as opposed to the court imposing a blanket but for test. Therefore, Your Honour, as to this crucial question of causation, I will make the submission that Justice Glenn Connor was correct to apply a relevant cause test in respect of the account of profit awarded against Ms Valdez Following this, my learned junior will make submission that Justice Glenn Kiner was correct to limit the award of equitable compensation against Ms Vivello to $200,000. And additionally, she will submit that Ms Armstrong should be required to elect between the compensatory remedy against Mr Smith and Ms Vivello or the gains-based remedy against Ms Valdez. Turning now to the substance of my submission, the relevant cause test applied by Justice Glenn Kiner should be the preferred test in this matter, and it is the most consistent with equitable principles. It is well settled law and agreed between both parties that a knowing recipient... What's the content of the word effective? Uh, effective, Your Honour, as being a... As opposed to merely giving rise to the occasion for the making of the profit, which the but-for test may satisfy, an effective cause would be one that, in the common sense understanding of effective, is a leading cause of that profit. Now, what do you say about your paragraph seven in your written submission, in the light of that? As to the quote from Warman and Dwyer, Your Honour? To require, well, we've had so many versions, we may not be the same document, so I'll read it out. <coughs> to require a Ms Valdez to, to disgorge all her profits would be unnecessarily punitive. Regard must be had of the severity of her breaches in order to better do justice between the parties. Yes, Your Honour. Now, you hear to that? Yes, we do, Your Honour. Now, how do you link that? with what you say is effective cause. 
How do you make those facts with the general proposition of effective cause? The facts of this case and the effective cause test that I seek to apply, Your Honour. I know, but why? It, it's our submission that in this case... Well, why does she escape with all these uh, profits she's made from share dealing? Your Honour, it's, it is not our submission that she would be escaping. It's our submission that Ms Valdez would be returning the account of profits which she wrongfully made on the investment, that being the $1 million gain in value of the house between its fair market value and the, mar and the value that she received for it. However, to require her to disgorge the further $2 million which she made on the investments as a result of the sale of her house would be unnecessarily punitive. It's our submission that these returns were made as a result not of the sale so of the I'm house. Just stopping at this word punitive. Yes, Your Honour. Um, isn't it always the case that there's an element of the punitive where the defendant has to disgorge a profit that the plaintiff couldn't or wouldn't have made? It's not always, Your Honour. It, it would always depend on the circumstance. Now, I note that our learned friends have placed a great deal of importance on the weight of equity's prophylactic purpose. However, with respect, that is not the overall purpose of equity. For one, as Your Honour has already pointed out, compensation is not a prophylactic. Rather, our learned friends are misquoting paragraph 9 of the majority's decision in Life Plan. In that paragraph, the court stated that the equitable disgorgement principle is a prophylactic rather than equity as a whole. Does it matter though? Because when it comes to the second defendant, or respondent, the daughter, we are talking about the kind of profit, are we not? As in, as to one, his one doesn't, is. one doesn't need to be so broad about what equity as a whole is trying to do. Right? One just needs to figure out what equity is trying to do in this case. Yes, yes. There's right. the doctrine that we have in mind, not the entirety of equity, which I cannot cover in my mind, but <laughs> perhaps you can enlighten us. Yes, you're right. So that distinction between equitable disgorgement as opposed to equity as a whole turns more towards my learned junior's submissions as to the compensatory remedy. Um, however, in regards to these submissions, we accept that a purpose of the, um, of the remedy is to be a prophylactic and to deter such conduct. Is there any concept of profits which are too remote? Yes, Your Honour, absolutely. And it, it is our submission that these profits are too remote, given the standard which we submit on these facts, this court should apply. So is it, is it your submission that equity has a remoteness principle? In relation to a knowing assistant who assisted a fiduciary in breach of their duty, it's our submission that given the difference in duties owed between a fiduciary to their beneficiary, as opposed to a knowing assistant who has no relationship with that beneficiary, there should be a difference in standard applied. So, in, for example, Your Honours, in the cases of Novaship and Life Plan, both have seen fit to apply this causation standard to the particular case, given the difference in relationship between that of a knowing assistant and the fiduciary himself. You're, you're speaking of causation, very much my desires remarks about causation, but assuming that we were talking about the sufficiency of the connection between the wrongful conduct and the profit, I'm speaking about a different concept, about, about cutting off the profit. Yes, Your Honour, so your question turns to at what point should we consider the profit as part of the wrongdoing and at what point the profit should be considered as part of the mere profits honestly generated by the party. Well, generated not, by the not, party. not part of the remedy. Yeah. Yes, yes, Your Honour. It's our submission that in this case, now I know the, the actual application of the test is not, is beyond the scope of the ground that's before the court today. The current ground is simply whether Justice Glencona erred by applying this particular test. However, if we were to look to the application of that test, it's our submission that the application of the relevant cause test would limit that profit to 
a mere $1 million as opposed to the $3 million which is sought by our learned friend. That being because the investment was not relevantly due to the um, due to the dishonestly gained one million dollars on top of the fair market value of the three uh, of the two million dollar property. So, your honours, perhaps no, it would be you, you, you use the word punitive too, don't you? At this stage in your argument, it's our submission that that would be too punitive. Given the law these of tort, punitive in various respects. What's up? Let's see about the word punitive. Um, we have exemplary damages in yes, this country. Yes, sir. Yeah. The one of the fundamental principles of equity is to do justice between the parties. It's our submission that it would not be doing justice between the parties to grant a windfall to one while punishing the other, given this particular set of facts. Perhaps in other circumstances, it would be the just outcome, such as in life plans. However, given these particular facts, and given that, as stated in Warman and Dwyer, the cardinal principle of equity is that the remedy be fashioned to the particular set of facts, it is our submission that these facts should and must be considered when determining how we should interpret the relevant sufficiency of the connection between the knowing assistant and the beneficiary. I wonder if, just to capture what the other judges uh, have in mind to some extent, would it be possible, as we, were as we were starting in Warman, to allow a full account of profits, including the three billion, million that you have in mind, but grant a just allowance to, rec to recognise the fact that your client, by luck or by skills, Cause the right spot to buy. Would that would that be one compromise that you think um, can can achieve the balance <laughs> in justice that that, that, that you should enjoy? Would that make sense to you? Uh, to allow a full say a full a full account of profits, but discounted by a little bit or a lot, as, as you probably want, to recognize the fact that buying shares is a pretty risky activity. Right. The second respondent picked the right shares. That's pretty skillful. Right. I've, I've shopped the share market myself before, never made any money. But <laughs> to, to recognize the fact that skills and efforts they apply to generate a profit from buying the right shares, would, would that not then address the concern that uh, you may have about the fact that perhaps the order is too pun punitive? But we could just say, well, grant, grant a full account of profits, but recognize the fact that costs have been incurred both the assumption of risk, as well as whatever effort that she went through to pick the right shares. Like in Warman, for instance, could, could that address the concern that you have? Uh, yes, Your Honour, there, there is the ability for the court to make just allowances in a given matter. Uh, however, it's our submission that, why, that, that there is no reason for the court to wait until that point in time. The, the court may, and on the authority, has the power to, apply the causation standard which it believes best fits the nature of the facts. And the different ways in which the court has determined to apply this causation standard can be seen in the differences between the judgments of Novaship and Life Plan. Although both courts determine to apply a different standard in both of those cases, it is our submission that they can be reconciled on the fact that the standard is determined by the particular facts of that case. So if we were to consider the facts of these cases side by side, I'll begin with the relevant facts in Novaship and Nickton, which was decided in, the 20, in 2014 in the UK Court of Appeal. Now why are we obsessed with Novaship? It's just a decision of the English Court of Appeal. Yes, Your Honour. However, by assessing that case, and we may... Clearly no judges in the Chancery Division. It's, it's our submission that, that by assessing the way in which the court in that case applied this principle and by assessing the way in which this court last year in life plan applied this principle to a knowing what assistant. What might be more useful for you is to explain to us what was the difference between Justice Nettle and the, the brutality judgment in life plan. They reached different results, didn't they, as to what the actual quantum of the remedy was? 
Uh, yes, yes, Your Honor, they did. Uh, Can you put your finger on what the critical distinction was between Justice Nettle and the, the other judges? At this point in time, I cannot, Your Honor, I would have to confer with my solicitor. Uh, in the interest of time, may, may I proceed with yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. If we were to consider the case of Nova Ship, in that case, as our learned friends have said, shipping vessels were leased at market rates to a knowing assistant as a result of a bribe which was a breach of a fiduciary duty. That knowing assistant then chartered these vessels, and because the market rates for chartering increased, the assistant made a larger than expected profit. Now they differed from the trial judge, didn't they? In Nova Ship? In, in Nova Ship, yes, Your Honour, but the reason that they differed was because, although this profit would not have been possible but for the breach, the Court of Appeal found that these profits were not effectively caused by the breach, but merely gave rise to the occasion for a profit to be made. And the logic behind this effective cause test can be seen when it is applied to that particular set of facts. The applicant in that case was looking to lease their ship. And although the lease was given to the assistant as a result of a breach, it was made at market rates. And so would have been given to anyone else at those same rates. Therefore, the applicant would not have been able to make those profits themselves. And any leasee would have made those same profits that the assistant did. As such, the court in that case determined that the most equitable outcome would be to find that any profits made by chartering those ships were not effectively caused by the breach itself. This can be contrasted to the approach taken in life plan. There, the directors of a company breached their fiduciary obligations by diverting much, if not all, of the existing business of their original employers to one of its competitors, where the directors subsequently joined. This breach was a particularly egregious one, and the knowing assistance of the competing company was critical to the breach being carried out. However, if, a buck, uh, if an effective cause test was used, the only profits to be accounted would be those made in direct furtherance of the five-year plan which was originally the breach, and all later profits built on top of this plan could be seen as too remote. So therefore, the court in life plan determined that as those profits would have been made by the applicant if the breach had not occurred, as well as the egregious nature of that breach itself, the court determined that the most equitable outcome in that case would be to apply the but-for causation standard. So if we return now to the facts of the present case, Your Honour, to require Ms Valdez to disgorge all of her profits would be unnecessarily punitive, as this court should have regard to the actual low level of culpability of Ms Valdez in relation to the breach, as well as having regard to the fact that Ms Valdez would have made the same investment, same, made the same return by investing her own funds, as was found by the trial judge of paragraph 10 of that judgment. Therefore, we submit that in order to better do justice between the parties, Justice Glenn Conner was correct to consider the true causative effect as the test which is more consistent with settled law. Finally, Your Honours, we note that our learned friends have contended that even if Justice Glenn Conner applied the correct test, that it was applied incorrectly, that being the but-for test. Respectfully, it is our submission, as we have stated, that the application of the test is beyond the ground of appeal itself. However, to respond briefly to their submission on this matter, even if the court were to apply this but-for causation standard, we submit that Ms Valdez's liability should be limited to 1.66 million as opposed to the full 3 million which our learned friends request. For their submissions on this, our learned friends rely on the principle that a defendant cannot avoid liability to disgorge profits which were made dishonestly by showing that those profits might have been made honestly. This principle is certainly correct, but the only profits made by Ms Valdez as a result of dishonesty in this case 
was the $1 million that she gained in excess of the fair market value of the house and the $666,000 which she made as a proportionate return on the investment of those funds. In contrast, the $2 million which Ms Valdez received as the fair market value of the house and the remaining $1.33 million proportionate return on investment which she made on those funds not only might have been made honestly, but in fact was made honestly. She would have sold that house at its market value of $2 million and even if the court today were to disgorge all $3 million of her profits, she would still be left with this $2 million figure to invest as she did. Therefore, even when applying the but for test, the recoverable amount should be limited to this $1.66 million figure as opposed to the $3 million figure requested by our lender friend. May it please the court, I now turn to my lender Jim. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Respect, Your Honours, 
without full appreciation of the context in which that statement in Grimaldi was made, we say it cannot operate as announcing a principle that knowing assistants and fiduciaries are jointly and severally liable in all circumstances without any consideration of the facts of the case. In Grimaldi, in that paragraph, the court articulated concern that if liability were to be several only, a claimant would need to undertake an onerous task to untangle the relative liabilities of the knowing assistant and the fiduciary. In that case, both parties work toward a mutual benefit and both received a mutual advantage. However, in the present case, whilst both did work together toward a common goal, Mr. Zelda's contribution was clearly separate to that of Mr. Smith's. He falsified the report on his own. And critically, Mr. Zelda gained no advantage or benefit himself. Do we know that? On the facts provided before us, there is no evidence that he did make a benefit, apart from perhaps a hiring fee to uh, falsify the report. That's not benefit enough to you, is it? No, but... Uh, sorry, you go. Uh, crucially so, this statement in Grimaldi was very concerned with the fact that the accountability or the contribution of both a fiduciary and a knowing assistant would be too entangled. As such, it would be too onerous of a task to separate that accountability. However, in this case, it is our submission that even if Your Honours would prefer a formulation where Mr. Zelda did um, receive enough of a benefit, the contribution of both parties were separate and easily ascertainable. In fact, the trial judge has already made a finding as to the relative culpability of each party. And as such, this critical concern of entanglement and needing to untangle their liabilities is not relevant before the court today. So you emphasize, do you, from paragraph 558 of Grimaldi, um, the sentence where they say, when wrongdoers so entangle their affairs, uh, it's not the claimant's task to untangle them for accountability purposes. You say there isn't that entanglement here. Is that right? Yes, Your Honour, that is correct. And we say... Why not? Because Mr Smith and Mr Zelda's contributions are separate in that Mr Zelda falsified the report on his own after being advised by Mr Smith. And even if I mean, there was a concern that the um, contributions were tangled to some extent, that would not create an onerous task for the claimant in this case because the trial judge has already undertaken the task to determine and untangle their relevant and relative accountabilities. If we were to vary the facts in paragraph three of the problem, so that Anna Armstrong pays the solicitor putting in on trust, be held on trust in the trust, solicitor's trust account, and it's then paid to the vendor. Does that change your answer? Your Honor, perhaps in that factual circumstance, there would be a more difficult situation before the court and there would be this concern. However, that is our ultimate submission today, that the statement in Grimaldi that our learned friends are seeking to rely on is not a hard and fast or rigid principle that applies in all cases. It may very well be authority that liability should be joint and several if there is this concern for entanglement. However, here, that is not a relevant matter before the court and as such, should not be taken as a principle that the liability is not several only. As such, Your Honours, uh, the authorities do not preclude Justice Glencona's award of equitable compensation, and as such, it is our submission that this award should not be disturbed, particularly because Ms. Armstrong still receives the full amount of her loss, and we are not contesting that she should receive any less than that amount. I turn now then to the final issue before this court, that of election, where it is our submission that Ms Armstrong should be required to elect between pursuing compensatory remedies against Mr Smith and Mr Zelda and the gains-based remedy against Ms Valdez. This submission, Your Honours, ultimately rests upon the principle that equitable compensation and an account of profits 
are alternative and not cumulative remedies where they arise out of the same fiduciary's breach. In cases where there is only a single fiduciary, for instance, Your Honours, election is required because both equitable compensation and an account of profits would arise from the one breached by that fiduciary. And it would be punitive to require that single fiduciary to provide both forms of remedy from that loss, uh, from that one breach. In, uh, election provides an inherent safeguard to ensure that the plaintiff never receives less than their loss because they are able to uh, select or elect the remedy which reaps the highest return. For example, if an account of profits were the remedy reaping the highest return, then a claimant would be fully compensated for their loss and still gain some additional profits on top of that. Put simply, Your Honours, election is required because it ensures a plaintiff does not receive unjust enrichment through double recovery, and it also avoids punishing the wrongdoer by requiring them to put forward two remedies. Turning to the facts of this case, where there are multiple wrongdoers, the same rationale that applies for a single fiduciary is still relevant in this circumstance. If equitable compensation was awarded, then Ms. Armstrong would be compensated the $1 million and returned her position as though Mr. Smith never breached his fiduciary duty. However, if an account of profits was also awarded, then Ms. Armstrong would receive another $1 million of profit. In this case, the facts are rather unique because her $1 million loss is the exact $1 million profit that Ms. Valdez made. As such, providing Ms. Armstrong with both remedies would require her, would allow her rather, to uh, have unjust enrichment and would also be punitive, requiring the defendants in this case to put forth an extra $1 million, which in effect was never involved in the transaction, since the loss is the exact same profit made. What do you say to the proposition put forward by the appellant that we are trying to be proactive here? If we were to say that only one of the defendants needs to cough up uh, the one million dollars that uh, we sought, some of them would go away without being sanctioned at all. They have breached the duty, but walk away with no, no, no liability to pay anything. How is that prophylactic? Yes, Your Honour, we do note that our learned friends have raised this policy concern. However, the weight to be given to that solution ultimately depends on whether the purpose of equitable remedies are to deter wrongdoers or punish them. As Chief Justice Spiegelman stated in the case of Harris and Digital Pulse at paragraph 52, equity is concerned with the conscience of parties. It does not set out to punish. And this is an important principle that has been applied in other cases, such as by Justice Dean in Regency and Dots. Since the purpose of equitable remedies is not punitive. It is our submission that it would not matter. What do you mean by punitive? We would... Isn't Regal Hastings and Gulliver punitive? It is our submission that the ultimate purpose is to deter wrongdoers from committing a breach, such that if they do commit such a breach, they may be required to compensate or disgorge their profits. And that negative consequence acts as a deterrence to hopefully prevent them from engaging in this wrongful conduct. And it is our submission that even if a party is required to elect, as we are submitting they should be required, this element of deterrence is still present because a party does not know that they will not have to provide a remedy up until the claimant has elected. Therefore, there is still an overarching principle of deterrence because there is still a chance that if they do something wrong and breach their duty, for example, or assist a fiduciary to breach uh, their duty, then they may still have to face consequences if a party would so elect. And given that it is our submission that the purpose of remedies is to have that deterrent factor, uh, it is our submission that an election would not inhibit that and would not erode that. What if I put to you that an account of profits isn't a deterrence, but actually is the performance of the fiduciary's obligation? Mm. 
Your Honor, we would say that um, in this case, um, election should still be present because even though a fiduciary is under a duty not to make wrongful profit for themselves, um, Ms. Armstrong should not be required to both receive equitable compensation and an account of profits for the same amount. In effect, the profits made were $1 million and she lost $1 million and she should not gain $2 million in return. Further to this, we do agree with our learned friend's submission that Ms. Armstrong is entitled to elect for a split election for each depend uh, defendant, as was held in the case of Club and the Club's proprietary limited. However, what our learned friends have failed to discuss is that in that case they rely on, the plaintiff was only entitled to recover an account of profits after they had completed the split election. Simply put, for each wrongdoer in that case, a plaintiff should be able to elect which remedy they prefer. Here, um, Ms. Armstrong has elected that Mr. Smith and Mr. Zelda should have equitable compensation and Ms. Zelda's an account of profits. However, then another ultimate election needs to occur where the totality of the compensation and the account of profit is compared and a plaintiff can select which one they want. Of course, that is normally the one that reaps the highest return. However, in this case, it is our submission that they would equate to the same amount given that the transaction um, resulted in a loss that led to Ms. Zelda's profit. Um, Your Honours, if, if I am unable to assist the court any further, we seek to rely on our written submission in respect of orders. May it please the court. Well, we thank counsel for their assistance and we'll take a short adjournment. <laughs>